Hi, I'm Ol' Sneelock. Well, I brought back a plane from the edge of destruction and made it working again, which is really all I ever try and do. I'm not trying to make a million dollar plane out of a two dollar plane. I would if I could, but that's not my level of expertise. I like these little transitional planes. I'll show you how I went about making it look like this. I'm going to put pencil marks on there so I can recognize what I've taken off. And I'll start with the 80 grit. You can see that I'm cutting here and not there. That's why I was having a hard time getting the plane blade to cut all the way across because this part was sticking out a lot further than this part because this part is scooped out. This beech wood is pretty hard, but that 80 grit is doing a good job of taking the material down. I'm going to turn it around so I keep the pressure even on it. That's working really well. I could have taken this out and put it on the disc sander or used a plane on it. Either one of which would have flattened it out faster than doing it this way. But nearly everybody has access to 80 grit sandpaper. And I want to give you an idea how you can work on your tools. This Stanley number 23 is considered a transitional plane. The original planes were all wood, they just had a metal blade. Then they wanted to make the, the planes have some of the nicer features of the iron plane without all the cost. So transitionals were sprung. They have a, a steel carriage to hold the plane blade and keep it in alignment and also to allow you to adjust it with this thumb wheel rather than having to tap the blade back and forth with a mallet which made the plane easier to use I wouldn't say better the the idea was to make them more easily used by everyone because you can only sell tools to people who can use them. And if your planes didn't work, people didn't buy them. So making a transitional plane, in my opinion, was an effort to broaden the market. Now there's a drawback to flattening a plane. 
when you flatten the plane out, you tend to widen the mouth because you're actually dropping the surface of the plane down to where the, the blade protrudes more. Now this little bit here is, is less than 20 thousandths. It, it won't make a big difference. But quite often these wooden planes, because they are wood, would tend to wear down at, over the centuries. And literally this one has been around for more than a century. When that happens, this mouth opens up and it makes it so that the front of the plane is no longer holding down the chip as it's being cut. It's not restricting it. So as the blade goes through the wood, digging into the wood, it tends to split out ahead of the plane, which causes it to not be a smooth cut. It tends to just look like somebody took a splitting wedge and split it. You get big chunks and chips out of it and it's hard to control. So I don't want to take this down too far. I would like to have this all flat, straight, and square all the way across the front of it. I don't think I'm going to reach that. I actually have enough done here that I could stop because this little bit of a groove there is quite deep. And by the time I got rid of it, I would take away another 10 thou, which I'm going to do just to show that it can be done, but it's not necessary. It, it, ages the plane without gaining any use. Okay, we've taken it far enough. Now we'll just take some of the scratches out from the 80 grit. Won't take long. After shaping the plane blade and cutting the beach, I'm going to have to change out this 80 grit. Most of the grit is gone on it. This little thing here, quite handy. This is a piece of heavy glass. It's not tempered glass. Tempered glass is hard to cut. This is just glass. And I made this as part of a challenge on Scout Crafters channel. And it was a thing that I had wanted to make and just hadn't had the time or inclination to do it. And I have been very happy with it. Kind of disappointed I hadn't made it earlier. All it is, a piece of three quarter inch wood. Plywood probably would work better. I used a piece of uh, dimensional lumber, which means it's not flat, it, it wants to curve. But it keeps the glass protected so it doesn't get bumped or banged and, and broken.
The sandpaper is like I said before, it's 80 grit, 100 grit, 120 and 150. I'm doing the 120 right now. When you're sanding, if you work up through the grits, each finer grit takes out the scratches left by the coarser grits. Now this little spot right here is still showing some of the wear from its previous use, but I'm not taking that down because this area right here is the part that you're concerned with. You wanna have the whole thing as flat as you can get it, obviously, so that the plane blade is held squarely to the stock. But something like this, most of the things that you're gonna be planing are gonna bridge over this. Just like if there's some scratches up here, it doesn't matter a whole lot because the, the plane is resting on the surface of the wood. Once again, every time I take something off of this, I'm shortening the life of the body of the plane. Now, you can replace this and just make a new one and put it on there. The iron will still be fine. The iron doesn't wear out. I mean, I've never seen one worn out. There's no moving parts on it other than this little brass knob and the adjuster. And if you adjust that once a job, that's pretty much it. And I don't know how about you guys, but I don't use a plane every day. So the plane probably will outlast me. It's already outlasted all its previous owners, which I'm sure there was a bunch. Okay, now we'll go with the finest one. Hit it with a 150. Okay, that looks good. Now I could go through and remove all the patina and the age marks from the wood, but I don't think that's necessary. This is in good shape. I can still read the numbers stamped across the toe of the plane and the body of the plane is in good shape too. There's no major damage to it. So I'm just gonna clean it up and I'm gonna put some paste wax on it and it's gonna look really nice. It's gonna feel good in my hand. And with a sharp blade in it, it's gonna work well. Which is what I'm really after. I'm, I'm not big into doing perfect restorations, bringing them back to what they look like when they were new. Or taking them onto some fanciful uh, level that just doesn't appeal to me. It's, it's, I like the work that other people do when they make them nice and shiny, but it's not a requirement for me. So I don't waste the time and effort. 
Not that I'm saying anybody else's work is a waste. Everybody makes their tools suit their needs. Get out my favorite Boston polish wax. Told this story a dozen times already. Well, probably. <laughs> According to my view levels, a, a good bit closer to a couple hundred thousand times. But my mom, when she passed, left me a tin of Boston Amber Polish Wax. And it smelled great. It worked wonderful. She bought it because she got into doing reproductions. She b bought furniture and put it together and finished it all up and it looked beautiful. She was very talented. So I used the Boston polish, Boston amber polish wax, up until the tin was empty. Then I went looking for it and I couldn't find it. Until I happened on to somebody mentioning the Boston company. And I went to the went through the link that they had posted, and there it was. Boston Polish Wax. It seems that uh, BWC is now the owner of the Boston Polish formula. I don't know if they bought the company that made it. It's been a while since I looked it up and I don't quite remember. But in any case, it is the same stuff. Smells just the same. Works just as good has the benefit of, of cleaning as it waxes. Because I think it has a little mineral spirits in it. I don't know, it might be turpentine. There's kind of a turpentine smell to it. But in any case, not only does it put a great shine on a part, it cleans it up and keeps it from rusting. That was the main thing. The first thing I used it on, because I didn't have anything else and it was sitting on the shelf, was my table saw. Back in the old shop, it was a converted hog barn. All I did was take the hog stalls out and patch the walls and repair the roof and put in some benches and a heater closed up the big holes in the walls. You could throw a cat through the wall easily. And turned it into my workshop. Now, it was heated, but it wasn't heated all the time. So during the winter, things got cold. And then especially in the spring, everything got condensation on it and it would rust. Just rust something fierce. So I, I was trying to find some way to stop my table saw bench, table saw top from rusting. So I put oil on it and that worked, but it didn't work really well. You had to keep the oil put on it because the oil would evaporate. And like I said, I hit upon this Boston polish wax and put it on and the table didn't rust. Matter of fact, everything I put it on didn't rust. So from then on, everything I worked on, I waxed because I wanted it to stay. I put a lot of work into making it work. Never was, like I said, I wasn't really into doing the full polish. I call it the full scout crafter because he makes things beautiful. He'll take a piece of steel and put a shine on it. You can see your hand in it. But this stuff does exactly what I want it to do. Everything I put this on is cleaner, 
water resistant and also it just feels nice sometimes when things are varnished they get kind of a well plastic coating on them and that plastic coating will raise a blister on my hand just quicker than anything so the wax puts kind of a velvet feel to it, best way I can describe it. And it works really nice. Like I said, Boston Polish Wax, made by the BM BWC company. Almost forgot to mention, when you put paste wax on a woodworking tool, it lets it slide very easily across the wood. Really nice for the bottom of a plane. Now I try and be real careful around that edge because I just spent a good amount of time sharpening it and it will definitely cut me. Okay, let's try this on a piece of wood. Now we're taking a full width chip.
down where I want to be. Nice thin chips. A lot of that is the direction of the cut. This is straight grain pine. But even straight grain has a little bit of a direction to it. That's a lot better. With the with the grain not perfectly parallel to the cut, if you go against the grain, it tends to raise little uh, hairs and splinters. But when you go with the grain, it cuts smoother and easier. If you have any suggestions for a new video, questions about today's video, or any of the other videos on the channel, just drop a note in the comments. You know I read them all. Thanks for watching. This video is not to be viewed by anyone under the age of 13 in the U.S. or 16 in the European Union without the express written permission of the parents or the legal guardians of the underage person. Such written permission must be on file at the local government entity in charge of enforcing the rules and regulations established by the FTC. Anyone violating these terms is admitting by default that they hold harmless the owners and operators of this channel. Any and all questions should be addressed to your local branch of the FTC.